gently and imagine with me. That doesn't mean fall off to sleep. So those of you whose person sitting next to you starts to snore, you have my permission to use your elbow to gently poke them in the ribs. But I invite you to close your eyes and imagine with me your church. Imagine your church responding to floods in Kentucky and in Colorado. Imagine your church responding to winter storm damage in Indiana. Imagine with me your church responding in the Philippines to the terrible typhoon they just had. To a chemical spill in West Virginia. Imagine your church responding to emergency refugee needs in the state of Georgia, in the state of California, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, the Congo, and the Sudan. Imagine your church responding with cold wave relief in Nepal and to volcano relief acts in El Salvador. and to the continuing drought in Nambia. Imagine with me your church providing assistance to and through the Liberia food security and literacy programs. To the mid-America region of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Oklahoma for emergency preparedness training in the face of continuing issues with tornadoes. Imagine your church being a part of the North American and United States Ecumenical Poverty Initiative, which is a group of 27 churches working to end hunger in the North American continent. Imagine your church in Bosnia, that torn, war-torn country, through an interfaith dialogue, intentionally working to bring peace to that war-torn part of the world. How many of you think that sounds like a church you want to be a part of? How many of you think that sounds like a busy church? Let me suggest to you and tell you what you do not know. All of those things, all of those responses that I've just shared with you have happened since January 1, 2014. Should I read the list again? Did I not do it well? Your church, somebody ought to say that louder. Your church, this group, that bell choir, that group that meets at 8.15 in the morning that we don't hardly ever see. You know, they don't come to you and you don't go to them. But we all do it together. We have responded in that many places to that many crises to that many issues, and it's February 16th. Yeah. Now, let me help you understand what your church does. In 2013, your church responded to 356 different crises 
and different issues around the world. Your church. That same or higher number in 2012, in 2011, and 2010, and 2009, your church reaching out all around the world to change lives together. This is the kind of church I want to be a part of. This is the kind of church that I want to inspire us to be a part of. Because when we can inspire and educate and motivate change anywhere around the world we can do it right here because we do it together today we're continuing our month focusing on love and compassion. And I have to tell you, last week we, we focused on love. And isn't it easy to focus on love? Love God. Love one another. Go ahead, look it around the room. You can say, I can love most of these people. I'm glad somebody caught that. You look around the room and, and you go, yeah, this is good. But this week we talk about compassion. And compassion is important because scripturally, compassion is how we are compelled by God to act when we love one another. When we love God. Compassion. It's what love tells us and how love tells us to live. Just so we understand that even better, I chose the text of the Good Samaritan. It's a familiar story. We know it. We, we're comfortable with it mostly. And I say mostly because there are parts of this story that are sometimes a bit troubling to us. It's like any story that Jesus tells, really. It's a story that kind of is meant to gnaw at us right here. Do you ever have that problem? You read scripture and you go, golly, past the Tums, I think that just is bad. The problem is, it doesn't matter how many Tums you take, it never seems to go away. And I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. We know this story. The Jewish lawyer. Now just so you know, that's not a lawyer like we think of a lawyer. It's it's, it's a guy who knew the law in the Old Testament days. It's a guy who knew the rules. It's a guy who could quote most of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and had read more of Numbers than any of us in here ever bothered. This lawyer is an expert in the law. And he's there that day to trap Jesus, to test him, to see if Jesus is really a good guy or not. And he comes to Jesus and he says to him, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to get eternal life? What do I have to do to be included in the in-group of heaven? And Jesus as Jesus so often does, looks at him and goes, in his head, I'm sure, this guy's trying to trick me. Watch this. And I'm thinking at some point, he turned around to his disciples and he said, hey, this guy just asked me a question. You know what's happening next, don't you? And they all said, yeah, he's going to get it. 
it's going to happen. Because every time Jesus gets asked a question about how to live life in, in the New Testament, he turns the tables. He, he turns to the person asking and he says, well, Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Scholar, Mr. Guy who knows all the answers, what does the Bible say? Now, that's problematic for a lot of us, but not for this guy. He knew what the Bible said. It's one of the best reasons to be in a Bible study because somebody says, what does the Bible say about something and you don't know the answer? That's bad. But this lawyer, he's got it. He looks at Jesus and I think he stood up straighter. I know the answer. You ever get that feeling? I know the answer. I know what it is. Oh, pick me, pick me, choose me. And Jesus says, well, what's the answer? And the guy says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, bingo! You got it. Do this and you're in. Do this and you shall have eternal life. Do this and live. And the guy goes, this was too easy. <laughs> and it didn't work. I'll ask him another question. Now, why is it that the people in the New Testament never get it? I don't know if you've ever noticed. You ask Jesus a question, he asks you a question back. And he always makes you look bad. He always makes you look uncomfortable. But this guy, once wasn't enough. He goes back. It's like going back for a second serving of mashed potatoes and gravy. Sounds really good till you see it on your waistline. And he goes and he says it. But, 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 who's my neighbor? Jesus says, let me tell you a story. There was a man. He was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the road from Jerusalem, he was robbed, beaten, stripped, left half dead. Now, I want you all to pay attention because this is the place you're going to learn something because your pastor learned something. <coughs> I've been preaching this sermon the wrong way for 30 years. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> the real reason you keep reading the Bible and keep doing Bible study is even old guys like me can see the light. Which means that some of you still have a chance. The man went from Jerusalem towards Jericho. Halfway, he gets beat up, attacked, and left for dead. Jesus then says, Along about that time came down a priest, a good guy, one of the holy of holy guys. This guy, he had it together. He knew the law too. And he says, Jesus says, and the priest, as he went down from Jerusalem towards Jericho, saw the man and passed by on the other side. Didn't stop, didn't pray, didn't call 911, didn't send up a smoke signal, nothing. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and this is what I learned. 
We have been for years and years and years telling ourselves that it was okay for the priest to do that. Because he was, after all, the priest. And because he was the priest, we think in our heads that he couldn't help the man because if he helped the man, he'd be made ceremonially unpure, and thus he wouldn't have been able to do his temp business in the temple. But read the Bible. It says he was, the man went from Jerusalem to Jericho. It also says that the priest went from Jerusalem down towards Jericho. He was done with his service in the temple. He has no excuse for passing by on the other side. We cannot, in our 21st or 22nd century mentality, make it okay. You see, we like making it okay because we keep thinking to ourselves, if we should happen to have to pass by, we want to have an excuse too. But, read your Bible. Any of you ever tried to justify the priest the way I talked about Absolutely. I've done it for 30 years. The Levite, Jesus says, was going down from Jerusalem towards Jericho. And he at least comes over and goes, Oh, he has been beaten up. He looks about half dead. I think I'll go by over here. He passes by, too, on the other side. Can't justify him, either. What I'm doing is I'm setting you up for knowing the first of the five things that this story teaches us about compassion. None of you are surprised that there are five things that this story teaches us. Verse 30, it says, And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves and was beaten and left half dead. Rule number one when it comes to compassion. What the priest and the Levite tell us is that compassion, when it's based on our love for other people and for God, is based on need, not on worth. We can't look at people and say, well, we can't give them compassion because they're not worth it. No. If you're alive, you deserve compassion. There's good news in that. Both of these men, the priest and the Levite, they saw the man that was beaten. But they didn't see the need. They saw the, the man, but because, quite frankly, of their, and I'm going to call it their lifeless religion, They played at church, but it didn't seem to affect the way they lived. And it brings me to a very important reflection question, and that is this. Does yours? Does your life reflect a lifeless religion or a faith-filled act of compassion? So first and foremost, it seems, compassion is based on need, not the worth of the individual. Now the second thing this passage in, in Luke tells us about compassion is found in this verse. He says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now I'm going to tell you, Jesus is telling this story to a bunch of Jews 
And they threw their hands up and went screaming from the room at this point. Because Jesus could have chosen any other person in the world to respond to the need of this man, and they would have been okay with it. But they chose, Jesus chose, the one person, the one individual, the one race that was absolutely incapable in their minds of doing anything good. He didn't choose a Jew to help another Jew. He didn't choose even a Roman to help a Jew. He chose a Samaritan. And given the natural inclination of Jews and Samaritans, I'm going to tell you that both of them could have been most likely to have expected the Samaritan to finish off the Jew instead of helping him. Today we call this the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's even kind of developed kind of a, a, a national following as, a, as an idea. You know, if you're a Good Samaritan, you're out there doing good for those who can't do good for themselves. But in Jesus' day, this phrase was an oxymoron. There's no such thing. This passage says, though, that when this man saw him, he had compassion. The Greek word here is a word that emanates from right here. Remember when I was talking about having tums? Yeah. You see, it's that feeling that comes right from the middle of your gut that says, pay attention. It's a feeling that stirs us and troubles us and keeps us awake at night until we do something. Because, my friends, compassion feels something. But that's not where it ends. The third thing that we're told here in this story is that compassion always, 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 when? When? Always. always does something. How many of you have ever said, somebody ought to do something about that? Any of you ever say that? Any of you ever driven by somebody on the street changing a tire and it looks like they're not doing it very well and you just kept right on going? Or did you stop and help? Compassion based on need and offered because of our deepest feelings always compels us to act. Verse 34 puts it this way. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds. He poured on oil and wine. He set him on his animal, took him to an inn, and he took care of him. He doesn't pass by. He doesn't just look at the need and go, well, somebody ought to do something. I've said that. Somebody ought to do something. He does something very significant. He moves not by him, not on the other side. He moves towards him. You see, love and compassion always moves us towards one another. Always. It always moves towards building relationships. I have to tell you, it's not something that just magically or mystically happens. Wouldn't it be nice if all we had to do was wave a magic wand and we were compassionate and good things happen? It doesn't work that way. It takes concentrated effort. It's, I'm going to tell you, it's usually not very convenient either. Have you ever noticed when you stop to help somebody change a tire, it's never at the right time for you? I guarantee you it wasn't at the right time for them either. <laughs> Let me think about this with you, what this guy did. Imagine, this is what he did. He cleansed the wound. He bandaged the wound. He transported the wounded. He housed the wounded. He cared for him. He spent time, he spent money, he made effort. 
You see, compassion requires that we do something, and it's never necessarily convenient. In fact, it's almost always not convenient. And that's not the last thing. The fourth thing is compassion always costs us something. Always. You cannot be compassionate and it be free. If you're really compassionate, it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you effort. It's going to cost you your patience. Just thought I'd put that out there because we think that everything ought to happen right now. We ought to solve all the problems right now. Well, we didn't get into the mess we're in right now. It took us a while. It's going to take us a while to get out of it. You saw everything that this guy paid for? He also did one other thing. He went into debt for this man. He signed a, uh, he signed a contract that said, you just keep taking care of him, and when I come back, I'll pay you what I owe you. He didn't say, oh, call the local church. They'll, they'll pay for a hotel room and they'll take care of it. He didn't say, call the police department. They'll take care of him and they'll run him out of town. They didn't say, send him down to Duncanville Outreach. They've got all the resources. No, he said, I'm willing to pay to take care of it. Now, I have to tell you that there's one more. And I'm going to tell you that I've given you the first four in order to tell you the one that's really important. And that's number five. Compassion, my friends, demonstrates our relationship with God. If you want to know whether or not someone has a real relationship with God, look at how compassionately they live their lives. Because they're connected like this. He says to the guy, after he tells the story, he says, which one of those three guys, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was a neighbor to the one who fell among the thieves. And, and I have to tell you, the lawyer was choking on his words. He can't even bring himself to say, well, of course the Samaritan was. So he responds in verse 37 with also the right answer, the one who showed mercy. And so at this point, Jesus tells him for the second time what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. When Jesus looks at him, and I think he looks deeper into his soul this time than he did the first time, and says, go and do likewise. You see, our compassion, based on our love, always compels us to act. We know that it's going to cost us something. We know that it comes from here. We know that it's based on the needs of the people. But sometimes we do try to justify it. But sometimes we try to get out of doing things that we know we've been called as a church and as individuals to do. So God gave us the book of James. That's what I tell people. Chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says it this way. If a brother or sister is naked and 
lax daily food. And one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet do not supply their needs. What is the good of that? For faith by itself, without works, is dead. It has no place. Our compassion always, always demonstrates whether or not we have a relationship with God. Here in this story, we see how the command to love one another is lived out with great compassion. And the question becomes, how compassionate are we?